Hi. Hello. Good evening. Good Most evening. Fun. Ça va? Ça va bien. Ça va très bien. Et toi? Uh, why très bien? First of all. <laughs> when, I see you, when I see you, it's always très bien. Oh my God. Oh my God. I'm blessed. I'm blessed. When, when I see you on the thin eye, it's très, très bien. <laughs> it's never going to be trop bien. <laughs> no, c'est réciproque. C'est réciproque. But before, before we, we start the show, uh, I need to first of all thank you because okay. we are getting close to our first anniversary of uh, yes. in Creole next, next week. And uh, I sincerely and honestly thank you for accept, having accepted my invitation when I asked you to join me to come and sit on my tinai. You said without even knowing what I was doing, you said yes. So thanks for this trust. Thanks for this friendship. For Thanks for this lovely, lovely, lovely collaboration. <laughs> Thank you. Well, I can equally say the same. You had no idea what you were getting into when you invited me. <laughs> no, but you know, I like, j'aime bien vivre avec le, j'aime bien jouer avec le feu. Well, on that note, I'm going to raise a toast to not exactly. just me, okay. but entire community that we have built around the Pinai. Community and our crew, Joseph, Rosa, Bina, um, Luca, Camilo. Luca, Luca and Camilo. Everybody, it's, it's an additive process. So people and jump off. To our, to our public. Without yeah. them, we are nothing. So, Absolutely. Okay, and merci à tout le monde. So now, you you yeah. before we start, okay then again. I I, I like I, I like your dress. What what is this? Oh, this thank is like you. Unusual. It's like <laughs> Afro Afro Asian mix, right? Is it, is it? It is, and it has it is always an Afro Asian mix. This is the prototype, uh, the pattern which became the dashiki shirt. You know, uh, it's um, it's called uh, Angelina. Uh, in Ghana, yes, and uh, there are many different names in different uh, in different uh, West African uh, you know markets for it. But Angelina, it's quite famous as Angelina, and it was created in 1967, if I'm not mistaken, by of course a Dutch designer at Flisco, um, and he used an Ethiopian Coptic shirt as a prototype. And the Coptic shirt itself, of course, as you can see, has the full traces of batik, of um, pattern circulation in the Eastern and Western Indian Ocean, the yoke, which is, of course, very Indic. Even, um, even the, 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 the shape looks very Ethiopian. I mean, like... This I created, the shape I created, but the oh, shape... Okay. Is, <laughs> I stole the shape from another beautiful top I have, which Wendell Rodericks made. But oh, the back okay, yeah. fits... If you can see the back, sorry to me, but this is no, a bit. No, 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 no. <laughs> okay, the point is this. Actually, why did I wear it? I could have worn a sari or many of the other. You know. uh, I wanted to uh, wear something which would sort of mimic the transoceanic trails of the food that we are going to talk about today. This is what we call a real performance. <laughs> I'm just, I'm just a performer. <laughs> I, like I like to perform my research, you know that. Um, but it's also about uh, transmediality, you know, from food to, to clothes. But it's yes, the same, yes, the same see, movement. They, 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 are, they are all interconnected. And, they are. you know, uh, uh, when the, when from day one, when we started the Tine Creole, of yeah. course, our first, what um, do um, Ensuite, je, je parle en français. Vernissage. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Was with, uh, Jean, uh, with Carpana and Gladys. Gladys yeah. Francis. But the second event, we, we, we started with uh, Kusini. It was with uh, Maya Parva. It was a book launch on Kusini and with Anita. So we yeah. already combined literature and food. How yeah. food is very central to our, our, our work. So we made it very clear from day one that Kusini... Yeah is 
the center of our uh, project. I would say absolutely, absolutely. I see so many friends here, and as always, yeah, we yeah. have my friends. We have a beautiful confluence of people who I know came into this community because they were originally your friends, um, like Francoise, for example. I see Francoise here. I see people, or Christina, or I see people who came in uh, who are here because they know me for a very long time, like Urmila, Urmila Devanaji, whom I know forever from Oxford. Um, but also there are people here like Praveen, like Mona Sundaram Dambalu, like Shati, uh, listen, listen, so there is a new person who has, who has just joined. There's a new person yeah. who has just joined. She's from Mauritius, but living in Canada. Is this Neelam? Uh, yeah, yeah. Neelam, Neelam Mardemutu. Mardem yeah. Mardemutu. So, hello from hello. Montreal. So, Neelam Mardemutu is running. Uh, she's a friend of uh, Joseph. And mm -hmm. they also do a lot of cultural um, prom promoter, pro promoting uh, yeah, Indian culture in Montreal yeah. through uh, uh, Mauritius connection. So Neelam, thank and you very I much. And I see and Lima. I see Lima Thomas here. And of course, oh, Lima. Hi, Lima. Hi, yeah. good it's to see you. Cool. Soon we are not going to be able to acknowledge everybody <laughs> because yeah, exactly. we need to get on and bring our and, guests. Oh, and, that is say my, and that is my friend Annie Mali on the other side on YouTube. Bonjour, Annie. So all, to all the people joining us from YouTube, of course, bonjour, bonsoir. Uh, thank you for coming on board from whichever <laughs> channel you can make it. We are really, really happy that we, we've swelled our community. You know, we started um, with your loyal fan base, Ari, who already were on the page because the page was dedicated to the book, the Thinai, and we, without telling them anything, <laughs> we changed it to the Thinai Creole one fine day. 26th of uh, May, uh, 2020. And um, those people were just, you know, hapless prisoners of this change. They, they, they took it on board. They became the base of our new community. We, we got lots of other people. We've doubled, basically we've doubled our numbers in the course of this, this year. Fantastic. Um, but um, yes, what, what, are we, what, what, have we, what have we learned? We've just learned that this enterprise, this desire to create a platform where we share things with you, all of you, it's really only gained in strength and has a raison d'etre because of you, because of our public and because of our guests. And there's no point, you know, you and I can just, well, we can keep talking. But well, we, 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 we have our ada, which is fun, which is thing. But when, when it comes to our curating, curated events, yeah. we had fabulous guests throughout the year. All of them yes. were fabulous we and we really, really thank them, all of them, to uh, to accepted our invitation. Even sometimes they, they didn't know even what we were what we were doing. Salut Chen. What we were doing, we just I said, hey, come over, come over the tonight. They just came in. See, and uh, that's how it works. We also must, uh, before we invite our guests for today, also remind people of the way we've, we've curated, the way we've met people whom we've then asked to join on board. Um, I think today's example is a very good one. Um, we we have uh, with us someone who whom I know for a very long time indeed. Uh, I'll introduce her uh, when she comes on. And we have somebody whom we both met totally through the Tinai Creole's work because when, and also the Kusini work, because when you were researching for one of the Kusini tales that we've been writing for the Indian Express, the fifth and final one in the series is out next week, folks, so don't miss it. Um, yeah, but this, um, this uh, Kusini tale on Puttu took you to uh, Amini's blog. No, I think we found yeah. it even before the Kusini tale, when we did a little post on Puttu last year. Mm -hmm. And I um, uh, forgot um, Parthiban. What? From, from Sri Lanka, who tagged me. I forgot his name. <laughs> he must be watching. And Tambi Anand Kochigada. Parthiban has tagged me to uh, Amini on that post. So that's yes. how I got to know. Uh, yeah, exactly. So that's so how we got this is how This is how we found people. People read our work. They okay. then tag their friends. Then we discover the friends. They become part of the community. And now Amini, who 
we discovered in this way as an amazing resource of food history is our guest on this uh, on this event so this is the way people we 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 just organically in a in a totally you know in a in a in a capillary fashion we have branched out <laughs> we are branching out it's also what we call the archipelago you know it's archipelagic the way we are creating nodes and connecting with each other so i think ari let's let's call our guests i think it, it's it's time but yes, before that, maybe, we should, maybe we should thank joseph publicly like old times of course you have to thank me every friday what <laughs> <laughs> what not sorry <laughs> my my you to say a few words um, about joseph and 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 his 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 um, and dreamy motion no i mean with, with, uh, as we already been saying every every event without joseph this platform would have never existed and uh, because technically you and maybe are totally like when at least you are a little more <laughs> little better than that is more au courant than you <laughs> exactly. yeah, she is more au courant uh, no, for, for practical reason from practical reason from day one we understood that we need the yeah. third person to operate and then you and me were free yeah and exactly. i approached i approached joseph on your back and even without hesitating he said yes anna i'm coming and yeah. here he is then he started dream emotion team they are doing fantastic with uh, patap khemel and he is 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 a just a marvelous person i'm yes. so happy to have him. thank you thank you for being with us thank you um, so generous um you know giving us your time being part of this uh, you know this this uh, being on the this is our kattumaram i like to think of it as our kattumaram we are all yes. on it <laughs> the kattumaram of the tinai yes. so, this is architectural marvel <laughs> the kattumaram of the tinai this is, this is exactly this is exactly the amarage of oh, kattumaram right. and gorgeous you see how you oh, cut the marrow in the tinai yes let's okay so uh, uh, just before that uh, there's one thing that I, that that i want to okay. say we are friday in france finally they open all the bars to and i had a, 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 just a small idea why not one day you are going to open a small tinai bar okay just think if you can <laughs> just <laughs> of course just see <laughs> 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 it will be very nice. We can we can, we can order a, a tinai masala. We can order a tinai with two glasses, but tinai motion soda, everything. Do you say what, Joseph? It, it, it's a good name for a cocktail. Tinai with two glasses. Bah oui. A tinai with two glasses, ça serait super. A tinai with two glasses. That's I a good think, name. For I, I think a tinai katumaram is already a cocktail. It's a linguistic. Okay. <laughs> 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 tinai, oh, yeah. you know, you know, no, no. Listen, listen, listen. Before we 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 get serious, I really know a guy who, who has been introduced through um, uh, Anik, who is a cocktail master, right? Mm -hmm. And he he create cocktails. Mm -hmm. oh. His name is Vic, Victor. Uh, Victor. Mm -hmm. Now he's going to work with Sylvain Pakiri in Pondicherry, uh, in, oh, in Villa Chanty. Yeah. Villa Chanty is going to make a cocktail to celebrate our first so, year. No, listen. I will ask him to make a new cocktail for us, which is called Tinai Katumaram. I think he must. What do you say? Kada mo, kada mo dusi. Kada wala. Okay, let's bring. Tambi, bring the name. Let's see the videos. Let's see the intro videos.
that was a nice introduction. Very nice. Hello. 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 <laughs> so, Amini, Hello. now you, you need to get up and dance for Jimmy Kikamal now. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what you're going to do, but now you have to dance for Jimmy Kikamal. Chavithu Natakam, Chavithu Natakam, we need to... Oh my goodness. Oh my goodness, she said. Anyway, um, thank you. Thank you for accepting our invitation. Thank you. Uh, welcome on the Tina Kriya. Who is going to go with whom? I can introduce Amini. So you go with Shailaja. Is that okay? Absolutely. Absolutely. So, uh, may... ladies first, dogs after. <laughs> I don't know what to say. <laughs> I was I was thinking that since um, anyway, let me start with Chalaja. In that case, uh, there are three ladies here. I don't know what the fourth one is. I, I am not <laughs> comment. <laughs> Self description. I'll leave that. But listen. I'm really happy to to be able to have um, Shailaja back with us on the Tinai because, as we know, she very sportingly jumped on on one of our Tinai Addas, and that's when we discovered this, um, you know, fund of information about millets and other such grains that she has up her sleeve. But of course, I am very happy to bring on the Tinai, a friend of decades, part of my Cambridge family. As I was telling people backstage, Shailaja, while you were racing on your bike to come onto the thin night, <laughs> your Cambridge Dawn bike. That's how I remember you. I don't know why, but I have this memory, maybe in 1994 or five, when I was part of the Cambridge, you know, postgraduate women's group. And you were the kind of faculty member representative. And we met in some meeting, but you came on your bike, you know, <laughs> you came whizzing in on the bike. So I kind of thought that she's doing that on the, you know, coming, coming to, find us on the thin eye by zipping through the <laughs> lanes and by lanes of Cambridge. So Shailaja is somebody who's been in Cambridge for a very long time indeed. Uh, she's at uh, the Department of Land Economy at Jesus College. She's a development economist. What I like best about Shailaja is that ever since I've known her, she has been for me a kind of model of academic scholarship and mentorship. You have always had these amazing students around you. When I've joined your family gatherings, there's always been graduate students at the table, people from all over the world who obviously cherish their association with you. And you're you know, flying around the world, delivering lectures from Chile to Uzbekistan to Belarusia to Japan. This is Shailaja. She's a fantastic scholar, but forget all that. More important, I think she's a great human being, always willing to share her knowledge and with widely diverse interests, obviously going back to economy, development, amelioration of societies. But um, it's now that I, I mean, we're talking about millets and food, but it's been education, hasn't it? There's been lots and lots of different areas you've um, focused on in your career as a development economist. Um, we'll, we won't ask you how you got to food, but first let's have, um, let's have Amini. Um, you know, introduced uh, to us formally by Ari. But welcome, Shailaja. It's really nice to have you here. Yeah, Amini, Amini is, a, is a living encyclopedia. Seriously. You know, it's, it's a, amazing what uh, Amini can write. And as we said in the beginning, we, I came to know Amini through the post about Putu. Somebody post about Putu and I did a comment. I, I'm, I'm really sorry, uh, uh, forgot his name because now I, so many names. I think it was, uh, uh, it's a Parthiman who lives in Sydney, who lives in Australia. Jiva, Jiva. Jiva, yeah, exactly, Jiva. So Jiva tag, tagged me, sorry, Parthiman, but that Parthiman comes from. So, so Jiva awesome. tagged me. Yeah, okay. So Jiva tagged me on that post and he said, Amini Ramachandran. He said, wow, that's interesting. So I went and uh, typed on that name, and then, but at the time, the uh, 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 blog was, um, it, it, it was, uh, she, she was doing something. It was not really, uh, really on. So I couldn't read the entire uh, blog. So later on, I immediately, I, I, I told you, I called you and I said, okay, there's an interesting person who's been writing on Putu about food. So let's, let's check her out. So I immediately called her and she graciously accepted my invitation. He said, yes. I would like to come and sit on a tinai, even without knowing what the tinai was about. But she just, 
But then, slowly, I, I read 99% of all our blogs is just mind-blowing. Is that each and every article is an essay itself. And what I like mostly about Amini, of course, there are so many people writing blogs and you know, food writers. But I think Amini started 20 years back, as she said, even before Facebook and Twitter and all these things existed. So even that day, she was like a uh, precursor, visionaire. She understood the interest of food yeah. among people and the interest of how to retrieve memory, the food memory. Mm -hmm. That is mm -hmm. very important because as we, uh, as we all know, our way of eating, habit change every day. And now you are talking, introducing Amini and you're going into your own essay. No, 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 wait, 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 no. So uh, <laughs> coming back to that. So what I like in Amini, it's mostly uh, because of the combination of literature and food. And as you know, I, I, I like to combine both. I mean, yeah. a good writer should be a good cook. <laughs> Vice versa, I don't know how it works. So in that way, I really thank Amini for, uh, for giving this opportunity to, uh, to invite you on this tonight. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ari. So before we move on to fire you with our <laughs> questions, <laughs> cannonballs of questions, <laughs> not really. You know, we are very relaxed on the thin eye. But we are just wondering if, you know, you, 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 you know, give, give, give the mic to our guests if you, you want us to, uh, you know, if you, if you would like to say something or, uh, you know, before we, we begin our Q&A proper. All well. In that case, I think we want to really, the main thing I would like us to start with is precisely this idea of your separate journeys. Um, both of you, uh, well, we just mentioned, I just mentioned Chalaja that, you know, when I first got to know you, you were working on many different areas in the area of development economy. Um, Amini too has had a very interesting career, uh, you know, which, seems to have not led intuitively and directly into <laughs> food writing. So it would be wonderful <laughs> to hear from the two of you where, I mean, you know, this journey, how you come to this interest that obviously makes you converge on the Tinai today and the Tinai Kusini, seeds of change. So Amini, do you want to tell us a little bit about, about how you came to, to, to write this visionary blog? Well, cooking, I started out of sheer necessity. I, I did not know to cook much when I first came to the United States, but I'm still a lifelong vegetarian, and it was very difficult in those days. And it was in a small town in Providence, Rhode Island, in the New England area, and uh, there was no Indian store. Forget about Indian restaurants. So uh, there was nothing <laughs> and unless I learned to cook. But I never thought about it before I came. So in those days, there was it was there is no internet or anything like that, so you cannot communicate right away. So my mother, every week, she would patiently write a couple of recipes and enclose in her letters, and then I will put it on my refrigerator with a magnet, look at it, and she will say, you know, and a and a pinch, and you know, a little bit of this, and look until it is well done and then move it from the stove. <laughs> that was the recipes, how it went. And uh, there was no measurements, nothing. But that's how I have seen back home everybody cook. So yeah. I tried that. And, and, you know, it was just uh, coming out okay, I think. And, you know, then some of our friends, you know, they would ask, well, I said, this is how we cook in Kerala. Mm -hmm. so you don't know, you're not from Kerala. Like, fortunately, <laughs> there was nobody else from Kerala in that town, so <laughs> I could fool them with my cooking. <laughs> and that's how we started with cooking. But writing was my hobby. I used to write for some magazines in Malayalam about mm -hmm. various different things, nothing about food. I never thought of writing about food. But then I collected all of my mother's recipes and I saved all her letters and all these notes. And then a few years later, you know, even the younger gen the whole younger generation in our family, they were not in India. They had moved away, you know, they had gone to school or whatever, you know, work, job, and everybody was out. And uh, and none of them could read Malayalam. All my uh, mother's grandchildren, they couldn't read or write Malayalam. They can speak. 
So I thought all these kind, you know, recipes are just going to be lost. I have to preserve them somehow. So I thought of writing about them, but uh, I was a financial analyst, number crunching in those days, and uh, I don't think anybody would, you know, let me write it and publish it. So I had to start somewhere. So a, a friend of mine suggested he can set up a blog for me and uh, start writing about uh, first about Kerala and its culture. And then you'll slowly move into food after that. And that's how I got started on the blog in the late 1990s or 99, 98, like that. I started that. And then I started wanted to you know, work on the recipes. And that was another challenge because you know none of those recipes had any measurements. And in the US, you cannot publish anything without a cup or a spoon and all that. <laughs> so I had to try to make them and then halfway through it, I'll forget that I didn't measure this. So I have to go back and redo it. And some ingredients not available. So I had to put my two sisters and one of my cousins to work on it in India because I can't find this jackfruit here. So can you do that and tell me how you did it? And they would go talk to you know family members and old relatives and collect recipes and so it just uh, the collection just grew and you know then i thought you know i just didn't want to do just a cookbook i wanted to tell them the story behind the recipes mm-hmm. and uh, the history behind it and mm-hmm. uh, then, then i when i was looking into it the history about uh, the trade and kerala was quite fascinating so i wanted to leave that into it so it just uh, added on to the blog and then i was getting good responses from family and friends and so it just grew and it took me seven years to finish the book. Wow. Uh, but as a financial analyst, you know, no publisher would take me because, uh, you know, it, you have to be a you know, well-known chef or a restaurant mm-hmm. or, mm-hmm. or a book publisher to pick you up. So we decided to go self-publishing. And in the meantime, I wanted to you know make sure that I was doing at least correctly in the for the American audience. And uh, so I joined the International Kingdom Professionals and I was in New York. So they had an excellent group called the Culinary Historians of New York, but they didn't stick to New York's food history. They went to worldwide food history and they were really helpful. You know, famous writers were members there and editors and they all helped me quite a bit. And, and then I self-published the book. But then the book was finished, my interest in history didn't stop. So yeah. I started another segment on my treasures from the past and started looking into old Indian books, not cookbooks, but there were, you know, even like from starting from the Sangam period mm-hmm. in South India, the old documents, they had some recipes, but like well, my mother's recipes, they did not have any measurements. So, but I just wrote what it was given there. So that's how that that went on, and uh, then occasionally I write about culture, and that's what got you all interested <laughs> about the Chowta Naraka. Yes. No, I think we got to know about the blog before the Chowta Naraka, but what was very fascinating for sure and is very interesting about your whole website is exactly that constant interpenetration of uh, food with other dimensions of uh, culture of the space of Kerala and it's like radiating out from there into different parts of the world because of these trade connections and uh, I think that's really which that is what intersects with uh, the approach that Ari and I take on the Thinai Creole that for us as we were just explaining before you came on food is part of a matrix of cultural connections and um, you know we enjoy looking at the connections which help us understand where food stands you know uh, as as an element of culture and identity and and connection and 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 so on. Um, but what was very interesting, I think, to hear from you, which would be inspiring, I know, to a lot of our um, our, our regulars. For example, people like Suda. You know, a lot of people have started out, especially in this year of the pandemic, even ourselves, to just use the um, resources of the internet to just put whatever we have inside us out there for others to connect to others to enjoy from and to learn from other each other mm. and um i think you did that already 20 years ago. is it a 20 years that the yes. web- uh-huh. yeah so at a very early stage you know in the internet's use 
in this way. You were pioneering, as, as Ari said, in a visionary fashion. And I think the way the cookbook grew organically out of the website, and then it fed back into developing the website into these different segments, you know, this give and take between the book and the internet. I think this, and the recipes for sure. <laughs> so I think this um, journey of yours, I think will inspire quite a few people. And um, we'll see hopefully some some other people's cookbooks arising, who knows, out of their, out of their, you know, adventures on, the, on, on Facebook. You know, I think, hey, Joseph, maybe we should see the cover of Amini's cookbook. The cover that Shailaja sent us. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I wish Shailaja got the thing. It's, it's a beautiful title. Uh, we'll come back to the book, uh, I think, uh, in a bit. Um, grains, greens, mm -hmm. and great coconuts. Nice alliteration there. <laughs> but maybe we should also hear from Shailaja uh, in, no, in her book. <clears throat> So Ananya, though you're right about education, my PhD actually is on food. Oh, okay. My PhD is on long-term trends in agriculture in India and China. That's right. So my, my initial interest was uh, in that same part of the archipelago from yeah. southern India to, to China. And I was collecting a series of words, unbeknownst to me, just as out of interest of words in both languages. And so early on, I started creating a glossary. So the first one that was fascinating was the word in Chinese, in, in, in Putonghua, in Mandarin, for ginger is jiang, jiang. And in Tamil, it's inji. Mm -hmm. And inji is an inversion of jiang. Jiang in ji. So there's a lot of trade words that we know where the words for many items of cooking in Tamil Nadu are distinctly different from other parts of southern India, which is interesting as it was a trade word possibly that came from elsewhere. So that was something I just stored in the back of my head. Mm. But by the time, of course, we met in the late 90s, I'd finished the PhD and I was moving on this big project on, on education. Mm. So how does that happen? Because I was curious about if people move off the land and move to cities and they don't have land, which is very much an economic issue of land use, and what kind of jobs and does education help? So that was that whole story of rural-urban transition. And coming out of that this new decade of work that I've been doing is really about trying to understand what other kinds of livelihoods people can have in the context where industrialization and the sort of understanding of late 20th century capitalism has often not delivered for many parts of the world. But most currently, it's around what do we do to feed ourselves in a sustainable way? Mm. And so millets became this fascinating way of returning to my former self in the 1990s, I had collected considerable data. At that time, everyone was looking at rice and wheat and maize as sources of uh, the Green Revolution story, which China too had, and, and sub-Saharan African countries didn't benefit from. But the actual link across all these countries are the millets. That's wow. the food that people eat. And today, in the 21st century, millets are the global South's equivalent of quinoa. It's the new wow. superfood. So... In short, that's how my story goes. Let's see some millet photos. Um, yeah. Joseph, we have some bags of millets. That <laughs> that's from yeah, Gulu Market in northern <laughs> Uganda. That's right. Yeah. Such as, tell us a little bit about these. What is here? What do we see? So you get you're getting a variety of millets, but you've also got on the northwestern quadrant you've got some lentils mm -hmm. and then in the southwest quadrant we've got amaranth which is an again a super seed mm -hmm. uh, and these what's fascinating here is of course look at the nature of the implements that are used mm -hmm. uh, there are a few plastic but most of them are gourds and yes they're yes, gourd they're gourd. spoons so I, I was trying to steal them off the lady. She wouldn't give them to me. So <laughs> I'm, I've got to go back to the market to get them from her. So my interest is, is I, I mean, I'm so influenced by the work that you're all doing on, on the Tinai Creole. 
I don't think authenticity, as you so rightly have said more than once, is 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 a genuine article of faith. What is fascinating is how we process, how we eat, how we ferment. And so that's where Amini's work for me made that wonderful contribution. So I have been enriched by your year and I celebrate what you've done, both of you, this year. Thank you, Ari. Thank you, Ananya. Thank you. Thank you, Shara Chand. That's very, very nice of you. I mean, this is a big validation. So that plate is the relationship between carbs, which is the small seed carbs, which is millets, the lentils, which is the protein, uh, and then the greens that you get, the classic plate is a sorghum millet plate with greens. And if you're rich, then a piece of meat. But the piece of meat depends on how much money and at what time of the year. So in Ethiopia, during their period of uh, fasting, which is the long uh, uh, Lenten period, they don't eat meat. The injera is only eaten with vegetables. And then that big celebration is when you have that meat after the end of that period of fasting. Can I ask again for the benefit of our audience, where exactly was the lovely photo from? Of the well, that's Gulu, which is northern Uganda, which is on the border with southern Sudan. And this is the area where people may remember the, the army, the, 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 the terrible army of children that recently we had when there was the Lord's army, when there was the violence. So it's that community in Gulu, which is in northern Uganda, where they have some amazing millets recipes that I've been collecting. Oh, <laughs> maybe you should tell us that's some, amazing. but Ari, you may, have, you may want to take this, take, take, no, take that's this. Amazing. I mean, uh, of course, I'm, I'm, I'm very interested in, in the, 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 our food habits, the way, uh, our, way we are consuming food and the seed chain from millet, millet to, uh, to rice. And I will come back to that. But I, I would like to uh, ask Amini, what, because um, since I'm a writer, I'm very much interested to literature. Uh, uh, where, where this idea of connecting all this Sangam literature, Puranaruri, Patupatu, Silapadigaro, you bringing all these food habits from this period and talk about food. As we, we talked like with Alam Abonku last time, you know, mm -hmm. A writer should write about what is eating, what is what the society. That's the way you you describe a society. Otherwise, you know, it's like as if like everybody's eating a bit the same the same thing. So there's some particularity. So tell me about your fascination for the ancient literature, the and the food. Because when it comes to cookbooks, uh, you know, India. Uh, we did not have many old cookbooks, you know, at least as, as not uh, put together as a cookbook. Mm -hmm. um, there were recipes in some novels, and you know, I have seen in Malayalam, you know, but it won't be the complete recipe, but uh, you know, it'll mention all the ingredients, something like that. So I thought I wanted to look into books which dealt with food, and I could find quite a few from uh, uh, Karnataka like the Manasol Nasa, Loko Bakara, and like that. But uh, further south, you know, from Kerala and Tamil Nadu, there were not many books. In fact, uh, the Kerala, I had seen old books were like mostly the Kerala Christians had published. Uh, there was Tangam Philip and Mrs. Yes. K. Matthew and their books. And uh, that was, you know, probably there will be one avial or a thorn, it's a stir fry, a vegetable dish in it, but most of the vegetarian food I have grown up eating, it, it wasn't anywhere. And that's what the reason I felt that I would like to document it. The same way I went back and there was nothing to go back to. And then I kept looking and uh, uh, then talked to friends. And then I realized that the Sangam literature had. And uh, unfortunately, I can only follow Tamil conversation. I cannot read it. <laughs> so... Uh, yeah, it, it was very difficult, but uh, fortunately, there is uh, a lady of Tamil origin in Hawaii by Dehi Herbert. She has complete translations of all Sangam works. Wow. And she was very helpful when I spoke to her, you know, how to, you know, go about it. And, you know, and she, in fact, uh, once came to Dallas where I live and she had a, you know, whole day seminar on, you know, her work and, uh, so I attended that and it was quite helpful. And her books, you know, were literally translating. You know, she would give one side Tamil and one side in English. 
So that quite a bit helped and that's how I picked up. And so you have to just go through the whole thing and then uh, find a recipe somewhere. But some of those recipes, you know, even though they are old, they are come out very good. In Can I think then, I mean, I'm quite interested by this. So obviously, now you grew up in Kerala. Yes. And, um, you know, the, 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 the food you're talking about, which then ultimately you document in greens, grains and grated coconuts, which is this vegetarian fare that, again, very household names like Tangam Philip may not have, obviously, because they are coming from a slightly different community and they would have a lot of different yes. things. But then if you look to the Tamil speaking world. <laughs> so just a little bit, a shift, a little shift. Uh -huh. And there in the ancient literature, if I've got it correct, in the Sangam literature, you have retrieved certain recipes. So you mean to say that there is a continuum between the food that you are eating and the food, I mean, not just a temporal continuum, but also spatial, I mean, and also linguistic shift from Malayalam to Tamil speaking world. I mean, I'm just, I'm just curious as yes. to how all this... Then Malayalam is really an offshoot of Tamil. Kerala was a part of the greater Tamilagam in old times. Mm -hmm. It separated as a different and the language even developed uh, mm -hmm. um, because you you know the Aura Pronobis, the yes. grandfather in it, you know, he was still talking Tamil. He wasn't yeah. talking Malayalam because Malayalam was just evolving at that 16th, 17th century mm -hmm. into a language. So there was a lot of Tamil words in it. So the culture was quite similar. Mm -hmm. And Kerala's, you know, separated only much, much later. Mm -hmm. I, I'm sure not many Kerala's yeah, would we can, we can that, always, but, you know, We have our roots in Tamil. Yeah, Malayalam is the Sanskritized version of Tamil. Yeah, there is a lot of Sanskrit and, the, you know, the Brahminical influence from the Nambudaris and uh, then it just uh, transformed into a different language. With men that still there was quite a bit. And being from the border of Kerala and Tamil Nadu, where I grew up, you know, I could, you know, understand Tamil pretty good. Sure. Tamil. So in terms of food, then tell us a bit about some of these recipes that you retrieved from the Sangam literature. Very curious to know then which straddles this more modern Shall we say? Well, there are a lot of recipes I wrote about, but I haven't tried all the meat recipes, <laughs> which I don't know. <laughs> so there was one simple recipe which really took off in our family, at least. It's with the pomegranate. Wow. You, uh -huh. you shell the pomegranate and then you uh, heat up some ghee and, uh, you know, saute black pepper and curry leaves. And then add the uh, pomegranate seeds in it. And... It was like a very tasty side dish. Wow. In fact, you know, um, my son usually, you know, um, my, my daughter-in-law is Irish-American, and so they celebrate Christmas, and they make this dish for Christmas. They say it's look Christmassy with the pom pomegranates and the curry leaves. So Fantastic. <laughs> I guess it is from my third century Sangam poem. <laughs> <laughs> A lovely uh, postscript for the Sangam dish. Yes. <laughs> also, the colors would be so Christmassy, you know, the, the bright red yeah, color. The color. Red yeah. Dish, yeah. Absolutely. And the red and green. And then. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. So, um, so this was really, um, I mean, this would suggest in a way continuity, wouldn't it? That across the millennia, we can still retrieve um, something that may not have measurements or, you know, details, but we can recognize the ingredients and we can still conjure up something which, which, you know, which works. But I mean, Shailaja, you were talking about millennia and recipes, but these were not so much a temporal shift, like a spatial one, right? Because you were talking about millet recipes from your yeah. African surgeons. Yeah, so I, uh, part of the, uh, I mean, I have an interest like many of us have in eating and, and in sharing recipes. So I've collected them for a while, but with the uh, advent of these projects, I mean, part of it is what uh, I guess you would call in, in social science nodal techniques. You speak to people, you first eat, you share, you discuss ingredients, recipes, and that triggers memories. And then you start collecting the recipe book. So when you start doing that, you start seeing that if there is an authenticity, it's actually in the processing of food and there may be more similarities than differences. So one of the things that's very interesting with millets, it, the millet flour has a very short 
shelf life. So okay. once you grind it, after a couple of days, certainly after a couple of weeks, it starts turning more bitter. So you need to use okay. it immediately. And that's one of the reasons that fermentation becomes helpful because you can keep the batter in the injera, for example. Mm. And many of you would say injera, teff. But teff is only one particular grain used for making injera, which is the Egyptian uh, 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 sourdough uh, uh, pancake that people associate. But the poorer you are, the more likely you use sorghum or, or, or possibly finger millet or, or maybe pearl millet. But these millets are, are interesting. So when you grind and ferment, this idea of fermentation, which is very old across the world, but obviously where it comes from and where it goes. So what we have with millet recipes is how do you eat and what do you eat? And, and I'm thinking about it partly because I'm an economist in terms of where's the nutritive value? What's the sale? Who's selling it at market? And so the point I was making earlier, if you're poor, you grow, you eat. You're what we call subsistence. So you, you grow the millets. In a bad year, you may have a limited amount, but it because it can survive harsh conditions, you'll get something. And that's why it's often called the poverty crop. In Kenya, it's called the poverty crop. In fact, my, my students would say, if say someone's eating millets, that means that you will go and give them food because it means that they're poor. So it's a measure of poverty. But as a grain, it's fascinating because when you eat millets and ferment it and you have it with greens, you're getting a balanced diet. So in a 21st century context, we're saying what's healthy. So we're all thinking today of eating smart, eating healthy, eating less, you know, not being obese. So these now become super grains. So we're trying to understand them because it's a global market. But when you go back and look at the community's understanding, sometimes because of the last 200 years of you know, first colonialism, which said, you know, everything that these uh, indigenous people are doing is clearly bad and everything we're doing is good. But then also with the Green Revolution, that rice and wheat are better because they come with scientific, you know, association. Millets disappeared. But they today become a way to try and understand what can communities do to survive. So mm. my interest in recipes is how do you work the millets? Because, you know, mm. working a millet is really hard. Can I be geeky for two minutes? So yes. millets have millets have seven covers in the grain, which you have to break down to be able to make the flour. Wow. That means there's a lot of pounding work going on to do it. And so classic is pounding for women. Mm. Whereas rice and wheat are called big grain. You can just winnow them and you lose the shell. So women often want to grow other things rather than this. So this is kind of history between labor and what's happening, which is very powerful. And yet, because millets are poverty grain, women will grow them on the side. It's hard work, but it's something to fall back on to feed your family. This is a fantastic gendered relationship in understanding this. So when you collect the recipes, who cooks them? Mm -hmm. Because millets are grown by women, they have certain recipes. And you talk to the men and they say, oh, we don't know how this is grown, but rice, we can tell you how it's grown. So it's quite fascinating. I was doing this in the Gulu situation. And then I also did it in West Africa, uh, which is, you know, I talk about maybe later we can talk about the Appam story with the Masa story. It's really interesting who cooks what when. And I was mm -hmm. struck when Amini said, you know, we don't know how to cook. It's fascinating to understand what happens in your Cucini tales, who's cooking and who's telling. It's a story. It's a very powerful story. Yeah, yeah. No, absolutely. Yes, it's very interesting what he's talking about. Who is cooking the Cucini tales? In our Cucini tales, everybody's cooking. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Even, even Tripod Dog Baba is cooking. <laughs> even the, everyone's a sous chef. <laughs> even the, even the, the Koravan is the biggest chef. You see, can you imagine? You know, from yeah, the yeah. top class Brahminical, the Koravan is the biggest chef there. So, Absolutely. So that's so, that's Ari's, that's Ari's utopia. <laughs> the <laughs> the Koravan and the dogs take over, you know. I leave it to imagination. Listen, but, listen, uh, Ananya, uh, uh, Sairaja was talking about fermentation. Now I need to get to the heart of the matter. I need to ask Amin. Yes. Talking on. about fermentation, is the Italy. <laughs> please. <laughs> give, me of give, me give, me give, me give me the story of Italy, please. <laughs> Italy has so many different stories. <laughs> In, Italy was first like, you know, by about 11th century onwards, there were documented evidence. And even in 920 AD, 
the Vardhana Hare of uh, you know, Subhakodi Ajarya had written about uh, Idli in uh, you know, Karnataka. But those Idlis were not made with a fermented batter. They were just uh, dal based. There was no rice in those. Okay. And uh, uh, then, you know, the story and even Ajayar does definitely say, but it could have been is he, the way, way he's saying that story that, you know, maybe when the traders from the Chola country went to Southeast Asia and there was a lot of, you know, Hinduism spreading there and those kings wanted to marry princesses from India and they came and those cooks, you know, showed them how they had a kedli. But I have never been able to find a recipe for kedli. Even Indo Indonesians, right, they don't know what it is, but they talk about some other dishes which they ferment. But fermentation, even Indonesians, at least I have read in one article that they say it came from China to them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's when they uh, they ferment soybeans. Mm -hmm. And that's how they learned it. And they have soybeans and uh, urad dal or mung dal, they are all about the same type of beans. And then you know, once they ferment, the fermentation part was not there. But, uh, you know, idli was made, but it was made as a fried thing, not as a steam cook. Uh -huh. Steam cooking was done for... For example, idiopam or putu, but uh, you know those are not fermented batters. Mm -hmm. But idli was done like that, and uh, so he thinks you know Katie Ajaya is the you know food famous food historian, and he says maybe we learn from them, maybe we learn the fermentation technique from them. And later on, even in this kedli, as I have read, it is only one bean fermented, but rice adding rice. It became, um, you know, it's a kind of, you know, accelerated the fermentation yeah. process. And that helped to make fluffier idlis. Fluffier, so, yeah. See, yeah. this is it. This is it, Amini. I mean, texture. The more I think about food and food history and transformation or taste, one realizes we have only four tastes or maybe the fifth umami, you know, sweet, mm. salty, sour, and uh, bitter and umami. And then all the spices are actually flavors. They're not tastes. Mm -hmm. What makes something uh, desirable for a culture is actually texture, you know, or, or even undesirable. Therefore, for some of us, something is too slippery or something is too glutinous, you know. And um, the, the research that I did on the puttu for our Kusini tale on puttu actually took me into some fascinating byways also of um, rice cultivation in a uh, global scale and then coming to Asia, the fact that there is this divide between um, sticky rice preferring culture, which is like there is almost like a diagonal line, which yeah. stops in northeast India. And mm -hmm. after that, it's fluffy rice and, 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 you know, long grain rice. But what is fascinating is that the technique of steaming, which seems to be the normal way to deal with sticky rice, somehow comes into the coastal air, maritime areas of the, you know, Coromandel and Malabar and seems to enter the, the repertoire. And suddenly you get all these steamed things, you know, with non-sticky rice. So it's very, it's, it's quite interesting how different techniques and come together. Yeah, it's, also, it's also interesting how this sticky rice, it's also liked only on different very particular occasions, like for Pongal, for example. We yes. don't mind eating yeah. sticky rice yeah. in Pongal. Even in right? Bengal, it yeah. will be used for those uh, uh, New Year harvest things. Exactly. You know, you'll have... We it's interesting how the rest Aisha. of the year you want to fluffy rice and only one particular day that sticky rice is the dish you should eat. So it's quite yeah. interesting. Very fascinating. But uh, the fermentation, I think, is another, you know, whole area that one never really... I mean, this gentleman I see by Sanjay Nagarajan has just given a comment or a question about whether there's any relationship between curd making and the fermentation going on in Italy. I leave it to the experts. Now I'm lost. <laughs> very different. Yes, very. Pakara, it is a, a 1025 AD. In that book, it says a thick batter of split. A black gram, which is the urad dal, yeah. and then they use the clear liquid that forms on top of yogurt and mix with it. And then, of course, they add a lot of spices with it. And then they do not say whether it is steam cooked, fried, or pan fried. How do they make it? And neither of these texts say that. But the yogurt was in the initial one, it was used the liquid from the yogurt. So that, that separates from the. Culture. 
to introduce the fermentation culture, the, the culture. Not so, the culture, the liquid that separates sometimes when you yeah. make yogurt. The yeah. decanted liquid, yeah. Right, yeah. yeah. Shailaza was about to say something. So no, yes. I was just going to add to this that the point about rice and millets is that they have coexisted in southern India. So at the same time, there are differences in spatiality about where they can be cultivated and the richness of the community. So at one level, we know going back to 3000 BC, there's evidence, you know, in this valley going forward of rice. Certainly from 1000 BC to now, we actually know rice is cultivated. So it's not rice is new. Right. But... Rice locally, when you think spatially across the subcontinent, particularly the 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 the, uh, uh, the southern uh, uh, region, depends entirely on the ability to have irrigation. So Kathleen Morrison talks about this in the Deccan particularly. I don't know, Anane was interested in Hyderabad on an earlier occasion, but this is a really powerful story. And it's actually the Kakatiya Empire. And it was a woman, the queen, uh, who decided that to help her women subjects, she would bring in water. So from growing millets, they started growing rice. But when the empire started falling, the Vijayanagara Empire then fell, the irrigation systems then became sub group, sub kingdoms, and the richer ones had rice, they became wealthy. So there's a class dimension and the poor still ate millets or fled to other other regions of southern India because they couldn't survive. So we know and, and Kathleen Morrison says this is about wet and dry. The poor eat dry food. Mm. The rich eat mm. wet food. So that in her mind, as an anthropologist, archaeologist, there's a connection between the wet and the rich and the irrigated and then the poor and the dry. But the uh, so that's quite a fascinating feature. Wet means that the grains themselves are moist or wetness in the production. That means you eat it with a sauce or you eat it with something else. The yogurt and rice made me think of that. Whereas uh, millets you would steam, but you wouldn't often have enough money to make or get a meat sauce. Uh, yeah. And peanut sauce and other things come later. So in her mind, looking at her archaeological evidence, she makes this claim. It's this a very powerful way of thinking about it. Tell me, Shailaja, it's very fascinating what you're saying. But this can be applied also in what we call in the Sangam literature, the, the uh, Ayantinai. Yes. The Ayantinai is a different region of, of Tamil Nadu that doesn't mm -hmm. take from the... So there is a lot of difference of food consumption there also. Yeah. Yeah. So is there also a kind of class and richness? Can can we can definitely, we say that? definitely? If I if I can move from seeds just for a moment, I mean I know just to talk about kires. My other passion is kires, different kinds of spinach. <laughs> they are like so many varieties of kires. So again, the idea that food is eaten because you're wealthy and you can show off, but food is also eaten for medicinal reasons and to survive. And so kires often come in as a way to, to deal with certain um, loss in your body or other forms. And of course, they're, they're a form of protein, but a, a lesser form. And, and, and so you think about the ways in which people survive. And, and so in some areas, we know that when you don't have kira, what do you eat? You eat ants because they also have the acid and the protein. And, and we know that these kinds of understanding in tribal communities exist in India today, but more in Eastern India. So a lot of my millet's work is linking what's happening in Southern India today. And, and the MS Swaminathan Foundation is, is a big player, linking to what's happening with tribal groups. And it's these groups that are reclaiming these kinds of millets. And that links to, of course, the, the 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 state government in Orissa having a millets mission and actually quite yeah. successful. 2023 is going to be the UN millets year. So my there's been some huge work and we're delighted to be in this space. I mean, some of my colleagues in Orissa have just moved heaven and earth to get these things happening. I will just so I'm sorry to go from the historical to the modern, but just to tell you, that's why we know, because we can now trace back and see how people, and so this idea of meat eating and non-meat eating or, or higher class, low class, these are all evolving. And, and, and you know, they, they, they coexist, they engage with each other. There's a contact zone, to use the language that most of you do. Guys, I have three or four very interesting comments. And while people are gathering, and Ari, you're going to talk about where we are taking this next. I want to say that Bina tells us that Ramaseri Idli of Kerala is known for its incredibly fluffy texture. I'm sure that people will agree on this, the experts from the region. Sanjay yeah. tells us about mixed millet laddus. We are really yeah. people are going down memory lane here. 
Nice, Sanjana. Nice to nice to nice to meet you. Yes, and Obair, not to be outdone, is reminding us and asking us about kanji rice. So. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, speaking no, of kanji. No, no. I want to just say I want to acknowledge my lovely students um Ivy um Jianning Lee and Rosa Buenel who took me for my first meal in London after a year um and we went to Dumplings Legend in Chinatown in Soho in London and uh, Ivy ordered congee for us nice. which was so perfect as uh -huh. a way to my London fast with congee so the kanji rice reminder of course it's the same word so you know it just kind of triggered um but uh, Listen, but yeah I, I, i would like to i would like now take us little uh, kind of voyage because yeah. um, you know, shalita was talking about the um, what do you call the, the similarities between injira and dosa the east mm. african rabbit and tamil nadu so please tell us and then i will take amini with the maratha maratha cuisine that i'm very okay. interested You are taking us to Maram here and there. Let's go off to Ethiopia now. Let's go to the okay. Red Hills. Uh, okay. So no, you know, I don't know. Katu Maram is somewhere in in the middle of the uh, uh, East African uh, seas. So there's a whole story there as well. How far the Katu Maram goes? But I think it's a really interesting feature. So obviously, as someone of 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 Tamil origin, sitting in in Bahirdar in in Ethiopia on a Sunday morning in a community which very kindly not only tells us but makes us. A, a sorghum based teff and a sorghum and teff based injera which is delicious and then uh, having made it uh, we move to the other part of the hut where we sit down and the injera is there and then she says wait and she pours this oil on top of it which is sesame oil and my brain is going okay that's fascinating and then she takes this red powder which for all purposes is going to be molagapudi and then she gives me a cup of coffee and i'm going I could be back home sitting in somewhere in Tanjore eating dosa on a Sunday morning. So this whole point about food ways they mm -hmm. trigger sensory memory and this idea of familiarity and the human body you know equally enjoying these things makes me wonder whether you know the idea of authentic should be just replaced by the the way in which the body interacts with food uh, mm -hmm. which which was fascinating so i don't really care which came from where i'm just interested in who brought it and what happened so your creolization <laughs> space for me was fascinating Well, you know, to to go back to the injera, all of us discovered Ethiopian food at some point or the other while in Europe, and had this eureka moment of what is going on with this injera. I just like those are so you know we were. But what's also very interesting is the wonderful combination of different kinds of vegetables that usually yeah. uh, to go back to the kire to you know assembled on the injera as plate. Of yeah. course, there's also the dawu, uh, the wort, and all these. Doro wort, doro wort. Thank you. All the very rich uh, meat-based curries, but I actually always prefer the vegetarian ones because they are the most like yeah. delicious. Um, to be honest, so that combination again of greens and some um, lentils, lentils, different kinds of lentils, yeah, um, and grain. Um, I remember um, in my uh, nutrition class, which it was a subject I did for my Uttar Madhyamik in in Calcutta, in my high secondary. <laughs> yeah. I don't even ask anyway. So I did a I did a subject on nutrition, um, but it was very useful because we learned things like um, this must be some fallback from the Nairobian days. But for example, a good vegetarian diet because people don't have access to meat, uh, animal protein. If you combine your greens, your lentils, and your uh, grains, whole grains, you get all the nine amino acids. So Correct. It, The protein in your body it combines and gives you a good uh, healthy meal but you need to have all of it and if you cook it in the chini chatti <laughs> uh, many in the iron wok then the iron leaches into the food and you Absolutely. also pregnant and that's what we were looking at in Ethiopia how often did they use the and they use exactly to as a similar color a clay yeah. color for making the dosa but they use an <laughs> iron wok to roast And so these are the kinds of things we're actually collecting not just recipes but that whole process is being documented and the purpose really is to reduce the amount of anemia because there's a new type of millet a pearl millet which Ecrisat's created which is biofortified iron so this would suddenly reduce in addition to using the iron we're trying to have different kinds of experiments to see what can be done 
Well, this is, of course, in, uh, to, to go back to Ireland, <laughs> which is, of course, uh, we've already been there via Amini's daughter-in-law. There, of course, forget about chini chatti. People, pregnant women are just drinking Guinness, you know, yeah. because yeah. <laughs> <laughs> just another, it's another little, way. <laughs> just another little kind of side discussion. But Ari, I know you want to take us. Yeah, to listen, another yeah, yeah. Amini, please tell us some stories about this. Um, I, I, I got uh, on two stories from you. One Ari, from the of demolish myths. Ari is trying to demolish no. all myths. Authenticity. All the the Marathas the, the, uh, of Tanjavur, and then I want to go to the Malabar coast with the Arab, because you you said something very interesting after watching a uh, converse uh, documentary, uh -huh. which is very very interesting documentary. Yeah, it's a the, very the, nice. The the the, 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 the relation between Tamil uh, Muslims and food, which. Mm -hmm also exist with the Kerala Muslims, you know. So there is no kind of like Tamil Muslims of Kerala Muslims because all the coastal area, they have very yeah. interest, in, interesting um, relation uh, with food because of living coastal area of all mm -hmm. the different influences. But let's start with the Maratha Sambar. <laughs> okay. Well, there are so many stories about uh, this uh, Safodi, uh, the king, the Maratha king, introducing it. But uh, you know, as a South Indian, I have to say it was the amti, the Maharashtrian amti. Mm -hmm. It's like a dal based curry, and in that they use the flowering agent hokum. Yeah. And uh, the the story goes, he ran out of it and. Somebody suggested, uh, some say it's a vidushaga, some say it is a cook, and whoever suggested it, he added that. And because of him, the name got. But uh, uh, all four South Indian states, they had their own uh, tamarind based curries before that. Tamil Nadu has uh, you know, um, the Purichu Kurumbu. And in fact, uh, the Sarabenda Paga Shastram, the vegetarian dishes, start with a recipe for Purita Purim. That's how he, he has written. And they were, you know, not in a kind of forcing the Maratha culture into the Tamil region. They were almost living like Tamilians and they respected the Tamil culture and they encouraged their arts and crafts and donated generously to the Tamil temples. And, but, you know, they, uh, they also had the Maratha food, but you know they, they always say it's a misnomer that it's a Tanjavur Maratha food. It, of course, none of these is in the typical Maratha food. But oh, yeah. probably because he introduced the use of uh, uh, the dal, the one that mostly used in Gujarat and uh, Maharashtra in old times, the tua dal. Mm. Because before that, in the South cooking, mostly it was the moong and the chana. In fact, even dosha started out as uh, like in about 11th or 12th century with uh, they were making doshas in those days with just the batter of chana dal ground and wow. started salt in it and making with that. And also just plain urad dal they were making. And later on the rice came into, still they did not ferment. And talking about dosha, there was a temple in uh, near Madurai in Tamil Nadu, Aragar Kovil. And in that temple, there is a dosha, but that's, they grind the batter and immediately they make it. They do not like, it's with rice oh, and wow. radar, but, wow. and then they literally fry it in ghee. So I tried one to show you. Ah, wow. This is how it looks. Oh, this is, <laughs> looks like more, Shailika, this looks like more like a adel, eh? I, 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 yeah, exactly. Like it, yeah, yeah. But it's a little more thicker. In, when I ground mm. the batter this morning, it was a little watery, so it didn't get that thick. But and it uh, it tastes good, but it has no fermented taste in it. And that temple still has that. Uh, uh, it's fascinating to go to these temples and the food. They still do that on stow, you know, wood burning stoves and in old, you know, metal pots and iron kadai and things like that. So that taste is very different. And you were mentioning the word uh, chinachati. You know, in Kerala, the, uh, it says that it, the Chinese brought yeah. that to Kerala. Yeah. And yeah. there is a theory that, you know, through the north, there is a, from Delhi, it went to 
China. The, so maybe it has come full circle to the south via Amazing. China. Uh, in China, that's why it's called the China Chetty. China meaning chi China. And uh, they always call these uh, ceramic bots, you know, China Bharani, because yeah. the Ch Chinese brought it and uh, it was still used in Kerala. And Kerala's uh, Chinese fishing in Kochi is very famous. That picture yeah. is, you know, yeah. in so many places you see that. So the Chinese influence was quite a bit for us too. But well, I don't know what food wise, what they did, maybe with some fish dishes, which, you know, I'm not familiar with. Well, I think I personally feel that some of this, uh, this is just my little fantasy maybe, but some of these steaming techniques with sticky rice and this idea of putting, because the put, you know, the idea of uh, uh, putting the rice uh, flour into the bamboo tubes. You see exactly the same. Uh, when that was in, in, in the Kodawa Hills, uh, in the, you know, in the Western Hills, they always exactly. did it with the, Correct. They had so many different puttu in, uh, in the Kodawa the cuisine. The 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 are side. making the best puttus for me. Yeah. They have the about five or six uh, different what kinds what of puttus. What I'm saying is that we can also think of a give and take. It could well be that all uh, the way out, they took that technique because now when you go to Indonesia, when you go to, um, when you are in uh, mm -hmm. different parts of the Philippines, you have the same word put to, you have the same technique, bamboo, yeah, right. and mm -hmm. uh, the segments, which the word put to has also come to mean segment in Tagalog and in Bahasas of different kinds. So philologically, I could not uh, discern, the, I, I didn't have at hand the the means to understand which was the loan word going in what direction. But it is clear that something has moved. So the Chinese influence could also be one of taking things away or out of, you know. Yeah. Um, uh, the and benefit. also, the, you know, the, the traders of the Chola Empire, they also took quite a bit. And uh, because they were going, I know, way back, uh, like in Funan, yeah. you know, that was the first century kingdom near, uh, you know, which is now Vietnam. Yeah, exactly. uh, and uh, so th they have those old temples there, and which is the you know the Shaivite temples mostly. It is a South Indian style temples in both China and in Funan and Cambodia, mm -hmm. and even the excavations done uh, there. You know they had unearthed quite a bit of you know old artifacts from that. So I, I, I just, think, yes, sorry, Chalaja, you, you want no, to say No, I just wanted to come in and say there are reiterations of these. One should be careful. They don't, I'm not saying any of us are, but, you know, these are re, re borrowings. So relearning, yes. if you like. So a lot of the Chini Chetti, a lot of those words are 18th, 19th century, but there are earlier versions. And as Amini says, there are some things that went much before. And we know that movements from Malacca coming back have created mm -hmm. things, mm -hmm. as with the Pepper Trail, things from here yes. going there. So there are are these iterations and tr that's why the collection of these trade terms is fascinating you want to then go back uh, so when you go back in so um, when you go into the Chinese um, uh, um, texts and particularly the trade text then you try and trace when a word comes in because of course there wasn't a standardized putonghua till as late as the 19th century so in in the various uh, 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 Chinese accounts you see different words and and that's what's so fascinating uh, uh, as with cha, tea, you yeah. know, we know the original word is Chinese, but that doesn't mean it comes from modern day China. It's yeah. across uh -huh. languages, which is what's so fascinating. Yeah. No, you know, this is it. I mean, my own um, work with theorizing creolization has come to really accept or promote this uh, model, which I call a swirled model. You know, mm -hmm. because usually people think of what binaries, one way uh, movements, even in the uh, the French um, term used for thinking about the Black Atlantic is aller retour, you know, going and coming. So this is mm -hmm. kind of linear almost, you know, uh, whereas I'm very, the Indian Ocean world, I think in particular, which has been one of the most densely networked. Uh, spaces. Uh, it's the it's the sea of the greatest, oldest connections. I think uh, you know of all the oceans. Mm -hmm. I, I think um, th there is a lot of this kind of swirling. You know, this kind of iterations, this movements back and forth, and you just lose track. What was the first? You know, and th maybe it's not even. It's boring to ask that. It's more interesting, as you said, mm -hmm. Shalika, and as Amini are demonstrating, uh, things coming and going, and then it's a matrix. You know, of shared. Some divergences, some adaptations, but a lot of commonality and recognition. 
And I think that's very fascinating in terms of a global culture. Right. And Ari, you were asking about the sambar, you know, surprisingly, that Sarabhad and Pagasastram is the only one, you know, luckily that book is like all the recipes are in exactly. English, Marathi, exactly. and then in Tamil. Every yeah. recipe is like that. It has only one single recipe for sambar, and that <laughs> is a sambar with neem leaves, and it has no dal in it. Wow. Yeah. It's very different, yes. And that's the but only that one they're calling it. Otherwise, that's, that's it is mostly kutu and... Uh, uh, you know, they have a lot of different rice recipes and then korumbu recipes, mm -hmm. and at least in the vegetarian section, that's what I see. Then it has both the, you know, English kitchen and also the non-veg kitchen. And uh, you know, and those those recipes, you know, I have not, you know, looked you know that much in detail, but the vegetarian section is mostly Tamilian recipes and this one only sambar recipes with neem leaves. Wow. As I, as I said, no, during our tech chat, because all these sambars and now murga kera sambar, murmaka sambar, everything, we got so tired of all these sambars and Pondicherry and we said, okay, let's take that mutton and put, throw it to the sambar. Put mutton in, <laughs> yes. <laughs> and that type of thing, it, uh, Sarabhendra Pagasastram always says, you know, they say, oh, if you want, don't want to put dal, put some dried lobster in it. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know that you could describe lobsters. That's what it said in one recipe. No, no one can do a mutton sambar than uh, Anita or Shea Pushpa. Uh -huh. Yes, that, uh, that uh, I can vouch for it because I did use her recipe. But um, thanks to the Pondicherians in my life, uh, yeah, this other, all these, these worlds of mutton sambar and crab rasam and whatnot opened up. And I think it just again goes to show that there isn't any boundary, you yeah. know. We have also we have also article rasam means like how do you say article rasam? How do you say in, uh, in, uh, um, eight legs? Yeah. What is this? Yes. Eight legs. R yeah. Rasam spiders? Yeah. Yeah. Article rasam. We no. article rasam. Yeah. 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 If you can eat, right. if you can eat ants, red ants are really nice and crunchy. Why can't you yes. eat spiders? Yes. Yes. I can eat ants. <laughs> so They're delicious. <laughs> They're really nice. I, I, I recommend know. them. I know. I just said very grandly, we should, we cannot draw boundaries, and I am showing my own Bengali boundaries here. One thing I know, personally speaking, it's very interesting when you think what are the limits to one's own, you know, like, <laughs> one's own kind of. You we know, don't have limits. Sorry, <laughs> I really cannot do uh, anything more than four legs. I've realized this. Two legs and four legs for me are the limit. <laughs> Eight okay. and all the rest beyond. Beyond that, you don't want to go. <laughs> <laughs> also, I realize anything that's amphibious, I can't deal with. Like, for example, the idea of a frog sitting inside both land and water. So I have, I have analyzed my own problems. I'm very <laughs> European. I can only deal with categories up and legs up to four in my hey, job. Listen, listen we, we really have a foodie here. Sanjay Nagarajan, I don't know who you are, but you're most welcome on our team, right? <laughs> because you are doing something very good here. Article Rasmus is made from mutton soup with a tinge of tamarind. Tinge of tamarind. Listen, buddy, come to our next dinner also, please. <laughs> Listen, I, want to, I don't want us to forget the the uh, converging of interests on the upper, uh, which of course Bengali that I am, I got confused with. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, revealing my a little <laughs> foolishnesses. But tell us about this. Uh, we were having an interesting discussion. Can we ask jo uh, Joseph if you could just put up the two pictures because that's really helpful. The two upper pictures, if this and the one masa one, if it's possible. But Joseph, you Stop. know, Teleja had sent us some Appam pictures and there was... One was Appam and one was Masa, if it's possible. Ah, this is the Nigerian yeah, yeah. Masa, right? Yeah. And the other one, please, Joseph, Adun Parnerela. Uh, this is the South Indian Appam. Thank you. Roman Andre Joseph. Mm -hmm. So what I wanted to talk about these two is because they have the same ingredients. Mm -hmm. Millets, banana, a mini, even cardamom. Uh, in more recent years, but definitely millets and banana put together, allowed to ferment for half an hour. And then the color in which they're made, even the number of curries is identical. Wow. So I kind of fell over and then I was like, what's it called? And then there was this argument. It's a bit like who owns 
hummus, right? Or who makes, uh, you know, the yeah. best uh, baba ganoush? <laughs> so the Nigerian, uh, these are all my previous PhD students. Uh, we were in Niger in the middle of December 2019. And the Nigerian student was there. It's called Waina, and it's from Nigeria. And the um, Halima answered, no, no, it's Masa, and it's from Niger. And my student from Benin said, no, no, it's from Benin. So the story <laughs> is that they're called different names. Now, here, Ananya, is why I said we need to write something. This masa is linked to the idea of masa sovada, which is bread in Portuguese, but coming from the Azores, mm -hmm. where clearly mm -hmm. now we know is a slave population. So yes. what went where with whom? But what's fascinating yes. about the Appam in South India is that there's a whole story, and somebody asked about jaggery in the chat. The whole mm -hmm. idea of using sweeteners comes later when there's wealth with sugar but just a banana and millets gives you that flavor and they cook it today it's fast food you'll get it on the street mm -hmm. and people eat it but it was so important and then i read amini's amazing piece about yeah. this other appam which was in silapadi karam which we have is a made and amini. we have a photo of jo joseph do you want to show us amini's appam photo please Hopefully you can find it. Yes. Yeah. Very yeah. beautifully presented. Yes. Much so, more beautiful. Yes. <laughs> um, but uh, yes, Shailaja. So um, then the question really is, is it about what works with what? It's your point about what do people eat and what do they want not want to eat? So is it about trying to get the carbs of the banana, which gives you the sweetness, like a sugar buzz. It's the equivalent of modern chocolate, if you like, or candy. And, yeah. and clearly, these were the things that were offered to the gods. So they're really, really important. And so I know that women, so in in in, in uh, when we were in, in, in Niger, we were in a women's market. And the women used to make them in the early morning and then eat them late at night to keep them traveling overnight so they right. could go home. So they're fascinating. You know, these are real sugar bombs. Yeah. Even in the Vedic times, they used to make appam with the barley and the sweetener then they used was honey. Correct. Ah. Yeah. And uh, then when the sugar cane came in a few centuries later, they would take the juice of it before making it into jaggery. The can sugar cane juice was used and later on it, you know, the sugar cane juice became jaggery and then they started using jaggery. And, and just to add to that, in all these countries today, including in South India and Tamil Nadu and across West Africa, these dishes are now made with pure white rice. Yes. Uh -huh. So this is the reason I'm going back to the millets and the rice. Repeatedly, we are seeing this interpolation between these. Well, you know, this also takes us back to a kind of the genesis of culture across uh, across. Uh, apparently disconnected uh, geographical spaces. And it's a bit like language. You know, I mean, linguists do research on deep structures. Like, it doesn't matter that in Chinese you have, uh, you don't have certain declensions or in Arabic you have a 10 ways of making plurals. Every language has a basic structure, you know, and, and those basic structures, it's like mathematics as well. You know, the, the, it's not, that's not kind of creolization in a sense. That's just kind of autogenesis it just comes up you know yeah. as part of human ev evolution and what i think is very fascinating for me at least in in talento biology or the whatever the ancient food you know studies on what people ate in prehistory i think it's very fascinating how all these ideas came up apparently like uh, in parallel right i mean let's combine a grain with a sweetener to give us that sugar burst let's let's add a bit of fat to then do something yeah and I find that actually quite interesting. But what happens obviously much later with the trade routes that people, I mean, like Amini, you are showing in the, say, the, the movement of, uh, of, say, pepper, you know, I mean, with trade, you have uh, perhaps another layer. Coming Absolutely. On. Yeah. Yes. And you have options because you have wealth. And this mm. is why class and wealth and trade matter, because then you can choose to, you know, the whole, sorry one minute of economics compared to advantage i grow something and i trade with something and suddenly you've got this other world which is absolutely fascinating yeah yeah absolutely you know this, this i'm i'm actually my mind is buzzing because now you know what i want to talk about though we have only like 
in theory, we actually should be drawing to an end because <laughs> <laughs> half an hour plus. You, know, you know very well when we talk, we start to talk about food, it's like never ending. This, this oh, is like drama, you know. This is like drama, you know, which is like and go on for. You know, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> So, ama, you know, ama. <laughs> so, exactly. <laughs> so, you know, for example, I'm thinking we 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 started talking about. I mean, the idea of using the term seeds of change for me was because I wanted us. Usually, Ari and I we have talked about dishes. We've talked about complex uh, assemblages. But mm -hmm. today, I think we were interested in going back to the basics. You know, the building blocks of food habits. Um, the small things, you know, and so we call it seeds. It could even, even have been grains of good sense or something. We <laughs> call it seeds of change. But um, the point is that now I am being drawn into thinking about what even lies before that. When Amini mentioned the neem leaves, you know, mm -hmm. I'm like, that's something, bitterness, you know, for example. It's just such a indic taste. Like, this is one thing I think that unites across the Vindhyas, at least, you know, like people like bitter things. We like our neem, we like our karela, we like our methi. So I'm, I think we could have such an interesting discussion even on these taste ways, you know, but maybe not today, but I don't know if I'm going to say something about this, about your observations on, the, on, on preference for things like neem, because actually it would seem to be not a very pleasant taste, you know, something that's bitter, but we love it. But isn't this true in Japanese food with umami? It's true across Africa. I mean, I've got a collection of greens going and they'll tell you at different times. This is my point about culinary medicine, the mm. idea of the body and what goes in and the people. And they said, so I, I asked things like, what do you do with uh, which, which of these do you cook at weddings and which in funerals? And, and so funerals, it's always bright and colorful things because you're respecting the person who's gone. But other times it's other things. And so I think, and the idea of the amaranth, it's such a tiny seed, but it's such a superfood more was not necessarily good mm. and so the Maasai and other people tell us this they eat limited they eat less but there's a there's almost like a magic associated with things I'll, I'll keep on with the taste is uh, one of the you know taste that you have to have you know different tastes they list bitter is always mentioned Ayurvedic texts yes mm. no, but you know I, I read it long long time back that what is the the, the beauty, the beauty of the Indian culinary tradition, the cuisine, it's if you take the the ingredients separately and you you crash them and you put them in the laboratory and go into the molecular aspect of each and every ingredients, they are not meant to be eaten together. Okay. And how the the Indian mind works, that for example, you take anise and you take uh, some other some other ingredients they don't molecularly they don't match taste wise but how you bring that taste together that is the beauty of the indian uh, cuisine <laughs> so ultimately we are being chauvinists and we are saying that we are <laughs> no 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 no, no, no. What, I'm, what i'm trying to say is that they yeah. they managed to they managed to capture the, the 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 essence of the taste that's what i'm trying to say I mean, no, I think of course, we, 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 think we are totally against. We are totally against food chauvinism. That's what we are doing this. <laughs> this event about. But what I'm trying to say is so is so fascinating how in the ancient times they managed to. When we're talking about taste, how they managed to take these different ingredients which are not meant to be together and made it taste out of that. That's why Amini's work with the ancient text is very important because it shows how far this, uh, these, these techniques and these, this knowledge goes, you know. Okay. Yeah. And the respect for different foods in different moments, different passages of time. This is what this is what that shared memory is about. It's not who who it owns it. It is what is the meaning it gives to a community. That's Absolutely. at the core. Absolutely. Very true. Absolutely. But that's exactly what we are working uh, on, uh, Chanja. The, the the food memory, memories. Yeah. I Absolutely. Mean, I, I'm, I'm writing memories, but uh, Ananya is analyzing memory. So that's and I'm what collecting the do. recipes to understand going forward how we can eat better and eat less. That yeah. is really the way forward for the planet. So 
that's where I'm coming from. And um, Amini is writing her amazing essays to record all this. Oh, the she's blog. absolutely. You are a font of knowledge, Amini. You're just amazing. Everybody's doing their bit. But you know what? I want to iterate. The I want to. I just do want to draw our our session on. Alas, that we have to start drawing it to a close. But I just want to kind of just make a few observations, drawing together what we've been talking about in such a pleasant uh, manner. I mean, firstly, I think it's important uh, that all our, the entire conversation really um, revealed um, this, this, yeah, the ceaseless toing and froing of, 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 of knowledge, of tastes, of techniques, um, implements, even, you know, um, and, and, that is why when people often say food memory, the idea is to short circuit to a kind of food chauvinism because the feeling would be that uh, memory is needed to protect identity of a community and you draw your boundaries. This is our idli. This is our sambar. This is our this. This is our that. What we have done today very deliberately is our usual thing. We've actually shown how none of these food memories are about drawing boundaries. They're about opening up and connecting. And the histories they encode are more often than not, not histories of um, segregation. Of course, that is also there. But we want to counterbalance that with the idea that there are food memories that encode histories of connection and exchange and encounter and cross fertilization. So I think this is really what our uh, Maratha Sambar and uh, uh, Masa, um, you know, in, in Niger, Niger and all this, you know, all these different uh, examples, I think, have reiterated this point, I hope, um, which is so important for us. And, and we need people like the two of you to, to tell us more about how we, how we, this is our intuition, but you give us the information to help us say, yes, this what we think is actually supported by your research, your work, your writing, and so on. Wouldn't you say so, Ari? Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, I'm, this is like a, one, of the, one of the best cuisine we ever had with a fantastic uh, researcher and writer and uh, Shailaja, such an expert in uh, different, uh, different fields. So, yeah, I, I, I really enjoyed it. So I need one more glass now. <laughs> but, but before wrapping up, one has to say that Amini is also a fantastic translator. Oh yes, oh, she is an amazing yeah. Shailaja. You, you you you'll be part of our small group of people who is going to uh, who is going to who are privileged to read the first uh, uh, what do you call version of the English. Translation of tell me the name in, in Malayalam, I always forget it. Oh, oh, Malayalam is the Latin name, Ora Pro Nobis. There is no uh, Malayalam. Yeah, yeah, but no, it, it's a Latin thing, but I, I'm always confused with Latin for me is like Chinese, so don't get me there. Pray for us. That's the English for it. But isn't this amazing? This la this wonderful novel uh, by Pojikara Rafi, um, which is um, using a, a term from liturgy. From, from European Latin liturgy, Ora Pro Nobis, but it is becoming a part of the Malayalam. But Wonderful. As, but as Amini has uh, alerted us to, she has translated this entire novel for us, and we cannot, we can't say how grateful we are. Beautiful. You. Beautiful. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Amini. Generous act. But as you alerted us early on, Amini, that you, because you're so precise, you know, you were like, let me tell you that not all the words are the same kind of Malayalam. There are characters who are speaking a more Tamil Malayalam, you know, Tamil verging on the Tamil, as you just mentioned, uh, you know. So this Malayalam itself, which already has in its title a Latin phrase, mm. also has other layers sedimented. Fascinating, into it. fascinating. And that's also the story yeah. of the food that we are talking about, you know. No, we, um, we send, that to, send this to you, Shailaja. It's brilliant. Good. It reminds me of Susan Bailey's work on Syrian Christians and that whole syncretism that occurs. It's amazing that whole understanding of, you know, what liturgy went, how it was. Ines Zupanov's work. I mean, there's such brilliant stuff that we now have that and shows this is these. The meaning, this is the meaning of our focus on the coastline, you know, yeah. because there is a porosity, there's a permeability and culture is passing through the coastline, which is not a firm boundary that says beyond this is India and out there is the sea and everybody else. 
No, it's a permeable membrane through which culture and, and of, of different kinds, whether it's food, language, clothes, weights and measures, you know, Absolutely. all sorts. But that's passing to and fro and, and making a, a space of um, shared, shared and varying culture, you know. Yeah. So um, I think we're really happy that we could invite the two of you to to, to and bring you know, to us. And, and, and thanks to thanks to the Putu, all these things started with Putu, and we wrote that beautiful uh, piece together with Kapri Mutapan and um, and uh, uh, Sanglikal Sanglikalpu uh, and the uh, Korovan. So yes, Korovan, Ari's favorite. And the, and the <laughs> so and everybody. The Please, Thank please, you very much. Is thanking our lovely guests. And uh, we really, very, very, um, I feel like we just were sitting in literally one of our denies and sharing, and this chat could go on forever. Um, but uh, give, give, like, give the last, last verse to Shailaja and Amini, please. Yes, Amini, over to you first. Yes, please. Well, thank you so much for inviting me. And it was really enjoyable discussing all this. And I learned so much about my lives from you, Shailuja. I do try to, you know, incorporate that in my everyday cooking. But you know, it, it's kind of uh, hit or miss. Sometimes it comes out good. Sometimes it doesn't. <laughs> <laughs> I am very happy. I do try and cook them every week. And I, I did millet galettes yesterday on Instagram for anybody who wants to follow. Okay. But very oh, happy. Yeah. I've I've also started collecting different powders. The other thing I'm interested in puris. And there are a huge number of puris going from Bedouin puris all the way down in Africa. They eat a lot of puris as well. And so uh -huh. I think... I mean, if I have now started following your recipes and your amazing book. So I think for me, I want to thank all three of you, but particularly Ananya and Ari. This year, you have made my life a happier place. So thank you so much. And I really appreciate having me on this program. And I hope to come back and tell you more in the future. Of course. Of course. <laughs> Next, over to the podies, um, Ari. <laughs> you know, talking about podies, my best podi is Chanangguni podies. Oh, uh -huh. Oh, <laughs> uh -huh. do you know what Chanamuni Pudi is? is? It's a small, tiny fish, dried fish. You Correct. grind and make a pudi out of that, and with mm -hmm. Chanamuni Pudi, with little, uh, what do you call, um, coconut, no, not coconut oil, but um, uh, sesame, sesame oil, sesame oil, sesame oil, on Chanamuni, best. So, Madam Ananya, Abu. Well, I would say that this is taking us, this is taking me to the dried fish of Bengal. And <laughs> we have the podi, but we would make a samba like wet thing with it, which pushes us into monsoon Asia. So, on the back of the podi, we go <laughs> from, again from, you know, west to east. Um, we are just uh, sojourning, you know, on the way in Akatumaram. Yeah. So, thanks everyone again thanks for joining us. Well, thank thanks for you. public. Thank you. Thank it's you. Thank it's you. been a great way to enter the week of our first anniversary. And at congratulations to both of you. Congratulations on your anniversary. You. Absolutely. So Thank next, you. Next, next Sunday, we're going to celebrate it on our Tinai Adda. And yeah. uh, please just just drop in. Because yes, everyone. It's going it's, it's to be Tinai Adda. It's going to be open Tinai. Whoever wants to jump in, please jump in. <laughs> Fantastic. You. Okay, everyone, thanks for being with us. Thank you, guests. Thank you, Ari. Thank you, And thank you, Joseph and Rosa yeah. and everybody yes. else you, who Joseph. helped us do this. Thank you. Okay, thank everyone, bye-bye. Have bye -bye. a lovely day. Bonsoir.